Okay. Welcome, Dr. Maya Kinzigler of Monarch Family Chiropractic, and welcome to tonight's workshop. Uh, I feel like it's only fitting sometimes when these workshops come up that we actually are seeing people currently with disc um, injuries in the office. And um, <clears throat> that's where the question we get, I think, fairly often is if people hear that they have a disc problem, they are really wondering, am I in the right place? Should I be seeing somebody else? Do I need uh, further diagnostics and more aggressive care and treatment for this injury? And my hope is today that we'll answer that question and also help you understand more about what a disc herniation is or a bulging disc or a slipped disc, because I know that language oftentimes is used, used everywhere and they don't always mean the exact same things. So let's get going here. Um, <clears throat> so first, I think it's important to understand the anatomy of the spine and then the language that we use. And so this is an MRI uh, in this picture. And as you're looking at it, those squares, so I'm gonna use, um, sometimes these seem obvious, but I, just don't want to assume. So here are your vertebrae. So five, four, three, two, one. So this is lumbar vertebra one, two, three, four. I guess I could have used a brighter color. And then five right here. Okay. So those are the bones in your low back. And between each bone, you have a uh, gelatinous, fibrous, connective tissue. Uh, that is called your disc, okay? And um, I want you to think of that like a jelly donut, but it's got a uh, <clears throat> jelly center and rings of fibrous tissue. And that allows for shock absorption to take place as you are walking and moving around. Okay, so you have discs in between each vertebra of the spine and you should have a C-shaped lumbar curve. And when you have that, right along here, this bright white right there, that's your spinal cord, okay? So when you have that lumbar curve, that spinal cord rests comfortably through that canal and those compressive forces acting on that spine, right? Um, that shock absorption takes place through those discs. Well, when you have a disc bulge, okay? Um, a disc bulge is when you have abnormal compressive forces acting on that disc and it pushes that jelly-like center outwards towards the outer portion of the disc. And it can be, um, I've got like a lumbar vertebra, it's like three, I think it's in the NPR room. Can you just grab that? <clears throat> uh, those outer spaces uh, are where all you, you have soft tissue, you have the cord, you have the nerve that exits out. And when you have that disc that bulges, thank you. When you have that disc that bulges, it impacts all of that stuff. So here I've got my vertebra here. So when it's pushing out, it's pushing out towards, you know, one of these holes where a nerve exits out, or you have all these soft tissues that connect from bone to bone or greater regions to greater regions, okay? Um, but that jelly center has not escaped, okay? Now, a disc herniation, that indicates that that jelly-like center of the lumbar disc has broken out of its fibrous tissue and it's starting to seep into, I mean, that jelly fluid has to go somewhere. And where does it go? It goes into the space where the nerve root, so that nerve that exits out of the spine, this is called your peripheral nerve, okay, that feeds everything outside of the spinal cord, it goes into this nerve root, or it goes into the cord in that space, okay? Um, so that is a disc herniation. Uh, slipped disc, I don't particularly love slipped disc. It's not really what's happening here. Um, I'm not sure why that language has been accepted, because a disc hasn't actually slipped. But it is a herniated disc or a ruptured disc. And all of that language is um, describing, you know, the health of 
the, sh the compressive forces acting on a disc. And if it's bulging or pushing out, and if you see all these, these yellow arrows, that's showing a disc bulge. Like right in the back here, I'm looking here, let me change my color so you can see what I'm talking about here. This right here, and let me actually just clear my drawings. So right here, that's a disc bulge. This is a disc bulge. Right here in the front, that's a bulging disc. When you get a herniation, look at what's happening to the cord right here. You've got that cord that is being impacted. It's actually, see how bright white it is all along here? how it's impacting and shading that color, that means that is a herniation seeping into and impacting the cord, okay? Yeah. Now I'm gonna get back into that in just a second because a lot of times the ways that we really evaluate um, disc herniation can be done um, diagnostically through imaging, it can be done through history and physical exam, but we're gonna get there in a second because I really want you to understand um, the health of our, um, Discs. So this is taking a sagittal view. So if I took this disc right here and I took a slice of it and then laid it down so you see the top half of it, this is what we're looking at, okay? So <clears throat> when you're looking at this far left picture, this is a healthy disc. Now the inside disc material is called uh, your nucleus propulsus, okay? So right in here is healthy gelatinous material. And these the disc is made up of annular fibers. This is like dense connective tissue um, that's made up kind of like a, it actually reminds me of a tree, right? You, you cut off the tree and you see those rings. You can see how old that tree is. These are rings of connective tissue, very fibrous, very strong. When you have those abnormal compressive forces acting on the spine, what happens is these outermost layers of your of this fibrous material starts to um, get tears in it, mini tears. Um, and as it goes on, you start to, as you look at this far picture right here, you're starting to get more tears getting closer and closer to that nucleus, uh, nuclear, nucleus propulsus. Uh, and again, we call this phase one degenerative change. And if you remember, when we go over that, that is just curve changes. So as the curve changes in your spine, it changes those compressive forces acting on that spine, which changes that disc's ability to take on stress and, and uh, take on shock absorption. Okay. So this is showing that there's tears in this disc space, but it's not necessarily impacting or causing a bulge, not certainly no herniation that's taking place. And there's likely no pain taking place. Okay. It's not until we get it further into degenerative change where we get more impact happening with the disc. So let's keep, continue going forward with what happens when you've got enough compressive forces acting on um, this disc in an abnormal way, those fibrous tissues are tearing. And when they tear, they're less, they're more, they're weaker. And so it starts to push that disc. Let me get my pen here. It starts to push this disc outwards. So there's your bulge right there because your fibrous tissue is so weakened that it can no longer contain the disc in um, the way it should. Okay, so this is when we get into phase two degeneration, where you start to see bone spurring. Well, um, you've got disc compression, so the disc is flattening. And then as that happens, you start to get a spine that starts to stabilize itself. So you get bone spurring taking place to try and create stability because of that abnormal compressive force. Now, I have this here because if you look at this middle section, uh, your spinal cord, so as an embryo, you have something called your notochord. Um, and the notochord of the embryo eventually becomes your spinal cord. Okay. And I'll tell you why that matters in a second here. Because <clears throat> when you have this disc bulge, and as you see, look at what's happening in this nucleus propulsus right here. 
it's starting to push out. So we're getting a bulge. This is breaking down. Oh, um, sorry, I wanna make sure I'm giving the giving you the right information. <clears throat> so um, if you look at this notochord here, so in the embryo, during development of um, a person, so us, um, you've got this notochord that eventually is made up of the discs in your spine, right through here. Okay, so this gelatinous material is made up of, um, you know, early, early stages of development, okay? And so why that's important is that as this gelatinous material starts to shift towards this direction, when you get a herniation, let me close this up here. When you actually get herniation that takes place here, this is not recognized by the body. So that means it's a massive immune response. It, the body doesn't recognize it as itself. Okay, so let me go back here. Let's clear this. So, okay. So we've got this disc bulge, this jelly that's starting to push out because you've got weakness happening to these annular fibers. Here's your spinal cord. Here's the exiting nerve along that spinal cord, okay? When you have total disc herniation, that means this jelly or this gelatinous material has exited um, into the space here, impacting this exiting nerve. This is a lot of pain here. This is a massive immune response. This is significant inflammation. The bulging could happen ex at an exiting nerve. It could happen straight back here into the spinal cord. Both of these types of herniations, regardless of if it's a disc bulge or herniation, depending on where that bulge is gonna take place, it's going to impact the symptomatology or what you're going to be experiencing. But when you have this level of stress to um, the disc and you have herniation, this is months of recovery and healing. It's a lot of work and there's a lot of pain that takes place during this time frame. okay? Um, so let me just go back. To, so when we're talking about disc herniation, the definitive diagnosis is an MRI because an MRI is gonna look at soft tissue. It's gonna look at the musculature. It's gonna look at the cord. It's gonna look at the discs, okay? That is the definitive diagnosis for um, an MRI. The question is, is will it change the treatment or the approach? Because a lot of times we can make a pretty good, um, you know, based on a history and an exam, we can, you know, 90, 95% accuracy know that this is a disc problem. There is either a bulge or a herniate. Well, and again, with the history and with the exam, it's really identifying if, there, if it's stable or if it's impacting a nerve that maybe impacts bowel, bowel and bladder, right? Are we so concerned that there's instability within the system that you impact the cord and the nerves that are exiting out that's going to impact um, and cause significant amounts of stress where conservative care isn't the you know, best approach here. Most people don't fall under that category. Most people are experiencing pain, no question, um, but can do very well with conservative care. So the question always needs to be, number one, what's the level of stress to the system? And number two, Will it change your approach in care and treatment? Because an MRI um, is exposing you to radiation. It costs a lot of money. Typically an MRI can be 500 bucks, could be more for a lumbar spine vertebra or lumbar spine vertebra, lumbar spine MRI could be more. Um, <clears throat> and that's the cash rate. If you're routing through insurance, it's probably significantly more. So an MRI is quite expensive. 
Um, it is a definitive way to identify if there's a disc herniation or a disc bulge. Um, and yet the question really needs, will it change the approach or the treatment that we're going to do? The other way we can diagnose that is through history and physical exam. Number one, we're looking at pain or symptom type. If you are experiencing a nerve pain, a nerve pain can be burning, hot and cold, could be numbness, could be weakness. Uh, it could travel along a specific pathway, okay? Um, <clears throat> and it could be very specific weakness. Like some people may not be able to, you know, um, go into extension, but they can go into flexion, no problem, right? So it's really assessing what we call motor sensory and reflex to see how deep we see stress reaching into the nervous system. How is the nervous system impacted? Um, and we can identify uh, pretty quickly what level it's showing up in the spine. And um, if we think it's a bulge or we think it's more of a herniation. Uh, <clears throat> X-ray will not tell you if there's a, a herniation or um, a bulge, but we can anticipate if we're seeing levels of degenerative change that the likelihood of that being in place is pretty high. So if you look at, you know, these are not the same people, by the way, but if you look at the far right uh, x-ray here, again, you'll see how they look different, right? Um, <clears throat> this is showing all of the soft tissue. So you see the disc space and the spinal cord. <clears throat> here, you're seen bone and we're seeing if there's any you know discs impacted look at this one look at how thin that is look at the whiteness that's around l5 right here can you guys see my pointer there i don't know if you can see it the whiteness that's right around here so when we see that uh, when we see that type of change there's a pretty good indicator that there's a disc impacted, could be bulging somewhere. And that's where you have to look at what's the um, history, what is the concern, what's the complaint that somebody's bringing to us. Um, <clears throat> and it could also be a component of, you know, like the straw that broke the camel's back sort of thing, where you just have enough cumulative stress over time and boom, that's what sets you off is reaching for an envelope in the top shelf and you have crippling pain, you say, I don't know what I did. I just reached for the, or I bent down to tie my shoe, right? It's the cumulative stress that um, shows up over time where that could be the thing that impacts and causes mm -hmm. the disc bulge to bulge in a way that you feel it and experience through your nervous system. Does that make sense? Um, so when we see an X-ray that shows, you know, an L5 S1, um, compressed disc, and this is pretty significant. I would say 75% com compression through here. We can make a pretty good educated guess on this. There's a disc bulge happening somewhere. It's pushing out either from the front or the back. It may not be impacting the nervous system at that point, but um, in a way that will give you significant stress or, or symptoms, um, this could just be low back pain. But again, we're looking at 20, 30 years down the road. If you start taking care of a spine that looks like this, you could deviate your trajectory. So you may not experience the symptoms that somebody would who does have a herniation. We also see people who have herniation type, I mean, who have significant amounts of pain and you look at their x-ray and it looks like a near perfect spine. And you have people who we take an x-ray and we see, you know, layers of degenerative change and their pain levels are a one and two. So that's why we got to look at the whole picture here to really assess somebody's health, right? Um, okay. So let me make sure, let me just go back sure. So I think the biggest thing with this slide is you know, some people just really want to know, like, nope, I want to see what my spine looks like. So they, they are going to get an MRI. But a lot of times it's really having a conversation with your healthcare provider saying, is this appropriate? Will it change what we do? If it doesn't change what we do, then I would say conservative care and, and really taking the next four to six weeks, or even sometimes it's two weeks. What do we see happen in two weeks or a shorter period of time to really assess, is this appropriate care? 
If it's not, if we're not evaluating it in a time, you know, we're not seeing incremental changes over time, then, then we may look at, okay, is there a referral that's appropriate or is there further imaging? Is there something we're missing? Does that make sense? Um, okay. So Monarch's approach to addressing disc um, injuries. And again, oftentimes when there's a disc injury and somebody's coming to see us, it's pretty acute. They're in a lot of pain. Um, so again, you look at how is that disc, how has that disc been impacted? We call it subluxation. Those malalignments in the spine that are putting stress on a nervous system that are causing abnormal compressive forces and a spine that's not moving in a global way as well. And segmentally, it's not moving as well. So when those compressive forces are acting on that system, it's causing stress to a disc. So we are looking at how can we make sure we take stress off of a nervous system, make sure the spine is moving in a healthy way to help with recovery, allow for um, the disc to, you know, move into more of a healthy state. Okay, so we always start with chiropractic adjustments. We've had people who we see daily for this. I mean, I've had people crawl into the office because they're in such a um, significant amounts of pain and they and they can't move. You know, I had somebody here yesterday who couldn't get off, actually was on the floor for a period of time. You know, so when you have these levels, these symptoms, it's scary. And you want to make sure you're in the right place. And we want to make sure you're in the right place too. But that's where it's addressing this on a very intense, intensive way of seeing, you know, daily visits that we want to assess. Are we seeing progress and change or do we need to make sure we're getting, we get you to the right place. Then it's doing appropriate exercises and movement is vital for healing here. Um, there's something called McKenzie exercises that, are specific to disc herniation. And I'm talking primarily about low back today, but you can have a herniation happen throughout your spine. Uh, and these McKenzie movements are meant to suction, I was literally suctioning the uh, disc back into um, that healthy space by very specific movements. I'm going to, um, I'll do this in the chat. Uh, and I'm also going to link a video of a uh, PT who's, who's demonstrating and dis describing McKenzie movements um, in a very great way that I think you can follow. Uh, I'm gonna link that to uh, this video once it's recorded. So I think it's, it's appropriate movements for most people to do. Um, but actually when we're doing McKenzie, it's taking the spine out of flexion and putting you into extension. And when we put you into extension, could be you know this um, vector, or it could even be this vector, depending on where that bulge is, um, but putting you to into extension to the degree that you're able to do it because you're doing it. And that literally suctions that disc back into place, but it takes time. It's not something that happens. No, it takes time and, and you have to continually do that work. Uh, we also do wobbles in our office um, on those discs and that wobbling is loading and unloading the spine. And again, it's going into flexion and extension. And when you do that in a health, I mean, when your spine is in a healthy state, that is a vital movement for you to do on a daily basis. Um, and what it's doing is it's actually engaging the musculature to take the spine through its healthy range of motion. It's um, making sure those discs are staying hydrated and getting good compressive forces to make sure those discs stay nice and plump. Um, done gently and intentionally, this can be a movement that you can do if you've got, you know, some, um, acute, I mean, if you're acute, but a lot of times we, I mean, the rule is listen to your body, you know, the difference between, between pain that causes, that's making things worse and just pain that's okay. I think I can work with this because it's just movement or something your body hasn't had. Um, I also think range of motion is important. Your spine is meant to move, period. So I think you've heard me say this at every workshop that I talk about this. If you're not moving your spine and it's normal ranges of motion, then it's then it's in more stress than not. So, you know, I'm going to use my head here instead of my low back, but your spine is meant to go into rotation. 
So if you have an injury to your spine and your movement is here, then that's where your movement's going to be because movement brings healing. It brings blood flow. It's going to help support the tissues to do what they're meant to do. So, you know, when you are experiencing, you know, a disc herniation, and again, it may not be right away, but you're going to start working into that motion that you can do. And you may be, you know, here, right? but you're going to be working into that. Um, and you're going to be low level. You know, you're, you're going to just be doing your body weight as well as you can. And then you can add more levels of stress to that. Pain management. Um, peppermint essential oil can be amazing. It's cooling. It helps address the body in a natural way in terms of giving and providing some pain relief. Deep Blue is a doTERRA uh, cream that is specific to musculoskeletal system. I think Dr. Kristen is a is a uh, uh, big proponent of that. Uh, and then also Arnica. Uh, if you watch the natural pain relief workshop we did, I talked extensively about Arnica. It can be used topically. It can be used internally. And then ice and heat. When it's a disc issue, heat tends to be um, a better option. Uh, ice can really flare things up. So that's where we like to use ice and heat in combo. Ice constricts, heat dilates, so it creates a pumping action, increases the circulation to that area. Um, so you may actually tend to prefer heat and not even use ice. We also like using Epsom salt baths as a heat. If you um, are tight and tense and rigid, sometimes there's a component that you are deficient in magnesium. Um, and so Epsom salt's a great source of that. You can do one to two cups. I would hire, you know, I would say more two cups, um, soak in a hot bath for 20 minutes. And then hydration. If you're hydrated, your body's going to pull from areas of, of, you know, hydration. So it'll pull from those discs. So you want to make sure you're drinking lots of water and you want to make sure, you know, that you've got the electrolytes, you got the magnesium, potassium, um, those sorts of things. So you can add some electrolytes to your water. And then the last thing, what you should be doing, especially if you're in acute flare up, you should be getting adjusted period. No question. You should be doing some spinal hygiene regularly. And it is to what you're able to do, right? This is not going to do three hours of spinal hygiene, but it's keeping motion into your spine in a healthy way. And again, this is under the recommendation and supervision of your healthcare provider. So if you are here with us, we are going to be supporting you and giving you instruction on what's appropriate. Um, limit sitting. Um, one of the worst postures you can be in, if you go over to this, don't call them. Uh, flexion, so forward flexion and then rotation is one of the worst postures you can be in, in in terms of your lumbar spine. Your lumbar spine vertebra, like six, seven degrees of rotation. That's all it really does. So if you're loading your spine and then you're rotating and really rotating it and cranking your spine, that puts a lot of stress. So we would say don't do any activity that's going to put you into flexion and rotation movement. So that's like vacuuming or raking or sweeping. Uh, for you athletes out there, if you have any type of low back, um, you know, issues, we do not like deadlifts. Okay. Deadlifts are putting you into forward flexion. Then you're grabbing a weight, really putting stress on your lumbar spine. And I mean, if, for, for those of you who don't know, so, I mean, you got a, a bar and you're pulling that weight up and then you're boom, putting a ton of pressure through your lumbar spine. It's just no deadlifting. Period. That's that's my rule for people. Stop deadlifting. There's other things you can do. Um, but back to sitting. If you're doing a lot of sitting, then add in rotation or bending forward. It puts a lot of stress on your lumbar spine. And the biggest thing is if you're carrying a lot of weight, especially through your middle, something like for every inch you add to your waist, it's like 10 more pounds of pressure being placed through your sacrum. So that's a lot of stress through your lumbar spine. Um, so you really want to work on reducing the weight you carry around your belly and the rule of thumb women you want to be less than 35 inches men less than 40 inches or you can be less than equal to and the way i would say this is just know what your measurement is right now and keep track of it every three months you can just gauge where you are um my don't is you know understanding what not to do in terms of movement i say this don't eat 
crap food or drink. Sugar is inflammatory. It impacts the immune response. It actually suppresses your immune response when you consume sugar. So, I mean, when you are flared up and really sick, this is not the time to eat crappy food, inflammatory food, processed food, sugary drinks. It's not the time to do it. And then last thing, don't go negative. Don't, you know, start hating on and speaking negatively about your body. Uh, a negative emotion can suppress your immune response by up to six hours. So the last thing you're going to want to do is um, be in a negative state. You've got to talk lovingly to your body. You've got to trust the people you're working with. You've got to trust the care that you're under. So you make sure you're in the right care and in the right place um, and then support the body that knows what to do. It just needs the right tools. So um, I know I went over tonight. I apologize for that. Uh, this is where I want to end. Okay. Um, it says no operation in any field of surgery leaves in its wake more human wreckage than the surgery on the lumbar discs. So it is vital that you are taking care of your spine in a healthy way and minimizing your risk for this. And if you are experiencing disc issues, disc problems, disc injury, you want to make sure you've got the right healthcare team around you to support your recovery and healing. If it's a conservative route, which most people, when addressed in, in the right time, you know, can do very well with conservative care. Surgery seems like a quick fix, but guess what? There's a lot of, I mean, they have diagnosis codes now for um, pain and problems post-surgery, you know? So it's not necessarily the answer, but this type of work that we are talking about takes an investment in your time and your health and your body the long term. It takes years to support the health. I mean, it takes your lifetime. We are all an accumulation of all the choices we've made. And, you know, we've got people who are coming back from stage four cancer. You have people who stop smoking and their body immediately creates healthy cells. So we are always with the body. Your body can heal. There is no cap on your potential, but you got to start giving the body what it needs, supporting the body in the way that you can. Um, so that's where I'll end, <laughs> you know. Uh, there's a lot of people who experience low back pain. There's a lot of people who are maybe looking for a different route or um, different options out there. And my hope is that if you hear somebody or you see somebody walking in a funny way, just share with them what you know. Get your spine checked. You can get your spine checked here for free. They don't need to stay for care. They don't need to go through an exam. They can at least get their spine checked. Um, you know, and the more people who are doing that, the healthier our community comes. Becomes. So thanks for being here. If you have questions, bring them with you. We love to answer those or at least be in conversation. And uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you when we see you. And next week, I think Doc is talking about uh, mindfulness and meditation. So it's going to be a great workshop next week. Um. <clears throat>